Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my conversation with uh, Sadhguru. Uh, he doesn't really need much of an introduction. Uh, this country and, and the international community know him well. Uh, he's a mystic, a visionary, humanitarian, a yogi, and he has a really fascinating outlook on how spirituality can help business, the economy. And we're really hoping to tap into that uh, today. Now, as a journalist, I travel to some of the world's hotspots and I continue to see death and destruction on a daily basis. And it's my job to bring that to your living rooms. But I also see the spirit of humanity. The human spirit is, is an incredible thing. And you can also see in these communities that one person can make a huge amount of change. So uh, in my conversation with Sadhguru, we, we, we're going to talk about these things, how you as individuals can make change and what our responsibility is individually, collectively, and as a society. Really great to talk to you, Sadhguru. Um, let's talk about, firstly, this concept of inclusive economies that you coined some 12 years ago. You took, you took the idea to Davos. Um, if you can briefly first tell me what you mean by it. Say, uh, Namaskar to everyone. When you run a business, whether you make uh, safety pins or computers or cars, somewhere the fundamental intention is you want to sell your safety pin to just all the 7.3 billion people. You are not thinking, I want two billion people to use my safety pin, others can use whatever they want. <laughs> you want all the 7.3 billion people to use your safety pin. So this, you can approach it either as a conquest or as an inclusion. If you approach it as a conquest, then the very process of what you're doing will be destructive in many ways, both for yourself and to the people, and to the general ecology and the situation. But if we do it as an inclusive process, not just conceptually, but in activity, in actual work that we do, there are many ways you could include people in making those safety pins, mm. where your production and your marketplace could be just about the same. If you do not include everybody, your business is not really matured in real sense. Whether you will get to sell it to all the 7.3 billion people or not is a, another matter. Somebody else may be also doing the same thing. But your intent is to include everybody into what you're doing. Now, if you want everybody to have it, not because you want to somehow sell something, because you want to contribute to their lives by giving the best that you can give, Naturally, businesses will grow, but the most important thing is people get included into the process. When this inclusiveness happens, you will see you sit on a very stable and safe platform for your business. Because these days businesses are growing larger than nations. In their budgets, many businesses have become larger than many other nations. When you have such a large investment and at stake, so many things. A nation has an army, a nation has various other instruments to protect itself. A business doesn't have these instruments. Its only safety is how much people want it. The safety of your business depends on how much people are loyal to what you're doing. If you build that loyalty and that inclusiveness from people around the world, then you are sitting on a safe platform. When you are sitting on a secure platform like that, you will have many opportunities to innovate, do many things because now creativity flows from variety of places. I'm… I'm just saying, suppose you are selling a safety pin, I'm mm. sticking to the safety pin <laughs> as the <laughs> most basic product. If you just give out a call across the world to your customers, please design a a new kind of safety pin if it's possible. For all you know, you may get thousand different designs free of cost. Mm. Mm. Like this we can do many things, I don't want to go into the detail of how each business can be run. 
but businesses should start looking how to make it more inclusive rather than approaching, you know, when I was first at the economic forum, I tried to change this terminology. People were referring to India as an emerging market. I said, don't call us a marketplace, we're people. Mm. If you see a human being as a human being and uh, you see how to contribute to that human being's life, that human being will become yours in many ways. I mean, you think this way and, and you have reached a, a mystical level where you can approach these things in a humane way. But the fact remains that the bulk of the global wealth is in the hands of a handful of people. I mean, they, just in a session previously uh, to this one, uh, they spoke about 70% of India's uh, wealth is in the hands of 10% of the people here. 50% of the country's wealth is in the hands of 1%. So it's, it's all good and well to ask a big business uh, to be more inclusive and be more humane in their approach, but it's actually on the grassroots level, it's not necessarily happening. So when they say wealth, they are thinking in terms of stocks and shares and stuff. That's fine. You don't expect everybody in the country to own that, all right? The important thing is everybody in the country and in the world should be able to fulfill their fundamental needs and their well-being. If we see how to facilitate this, instead of seeing them as marketplace, if you see them as human beings and see how to facilitate this, instead of manufacturing what you want and try to sell it to them, if you manufacture what they want, what they need in their lives, it would become very inclusive. We prepared an elaborate system of how this could be done for a variety of industries. Has it become more inclusive than before in the last ten, twelve years? I would say yes to some extent, not to the extent that we would want, but definitely it's a little more inclusive. And uh, you can see this just now, I've been on a thirty-day ride across the country, I've been driven from, dr driving from Kanyakumari to the foothills of Himalayas. As I see India, I've done this many times earlier on a motorcycle, later on driving around. The last time I did was about eight, nine years ago. Mm. Nine years ago how India was, nine years ago what people's condition was, what it is today is phenomenally different. At least eighty percent of the roads that I drove on this time is as good as anywhere in the world, really. Only one thing is the road is good, once in a way an odd guy is coming on the wrong side. I think he's an American guy <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you're right, and we often report, you know, internationally about India's growing middle class and, and uh, you know, that, that people are becoming more affluent. But equally, do you think in a technological age, it's also creating resentment in this country as well, where you can see that someone has the latest iPhone, for example, or they have the best job, they have more access to information now, that perhaps it's creating more of a resentment, especially with this current generation. <coughs> the resentment uh, could be there in certain segments of society or in certain people, individual people will be resentful for so many things. Within a family of four or five, one person will be resentful about somebody else within the family. So unfortunately, human beings are still like that. But I don't believe your resentment is rising, aspirations are rising. I don't think resentment is rising. It is just that, as we were <laughs> talking, every small thing is reported, every small thing comes into your sitting room, so it looks like everything is going up. But believe me, the world is more peaceful than it ever was in the history of humanity. And the number of people, the populations have multiplied, but still our violence has not multiplied. Still there are things which must end, that's a different matter. But today if ten people die somewhere, it just… the blood pours into our sitting room because of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We, we do… I mean, because people have access to so much information, um, death and destruction has always existed. In fact, less so now, I would say, but because we 
are able to instantaneously give people that information, they see it immediately. At the same time, there are so many tools or technologies to express your resentment. The moment you feel something, immediately you're on the Facebook. <laughs> if it was… <laughs> if it was twenty-five years ago, by the time you walked home, it would be gone. But before you go home, you already texted a thousand people and they said so many things and by the time you go home, this resentment has multiplied into ten thousand people. So, which was not so earlier, you saw… you got, got upset about something, you had physical activity to do. By the time you walked home or reached your workplace, normally it would be gone. But today you try to express it. But at the same time, what I see is, I'm seeing one thing among the kids. Because they're so exposed to so many things which we were not exposed to when we were children, there's a kind of a wisdom about them also. They're able to take these things with a certain kind of uh, a dispassion about a lot of things. Uh, we grew up at a time where always uh, people around me and myself, we were always talking about a revolution, the times of Che, you know <laughs> but not today. Today people are talking about their aspirations. They're not thinking of large-scale disruption of present uh, situations to achieve something. They're seeing how to exploit the present situation to fulfill their aspirations. In our time, we did not think of our own self-aspirations. We thought ev everything, the whole system has to change, this has to happen, that has to happen. I see from that hot-headedness that we were as youth. Mm. Today, I think they're a little cool and I think the terminology has changed. See, when we were young, if something was really good, we said, oh, it's hot. <laughs> now they're saying it's cool <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, we are seeing fractures globally in the international community. I mean, there's been so much discussion around the uh, election of Donald Trump, you know, why that happened. With Brexit in the UK, why that's happening. With the migrant crisis, with people being pushed out of their homes and communities, and conversations about far-right movements in, in Europe. Do you think attitudes globally are hardening? You talk about the revolution of your time and people are more cool now. But from the experiences that I have reporting in these places that I sense that attitudes are hardening and people are identifying more now. There's more sense of identity politics. I think we have, uh, in the last couple of decades, we have overdone this political correctness too much. People are sick of it, trying to be right about everything, not looking at what people's needs are, but uh, too much political correctness, every word that you say, you have to say it in a certain way. Uh, this has led to a certain level of frustration, particularly in the United States. Now, uh, they're trying to protect their rights because they feel threatened. The majorities, the majority communities in various nations are feeling little uncomfortable because they feel slowly it is being taken over. Mm. Whether it's real or it's just perceptional, it doesn't matter. But this feeling is strong, it is strong in India also. Because constantly talking minoritism, people feel uncomfortable, what is… It, what is going to happen to us? Mm. So, we must understand this, minorities have always stuck together. And because of this, politicians have played these games because minority votes are the only things which come en masse. Majority votes will never come en masse. So they always focused on them, gave them better things to such a point, I must tell you this, this is shocking but it happened in this country. One of the… our former prime minister said, the first access to all resource must be to the minorities, particularly to the Muslim minorities. You should not say such things. Even if you intend, you should not say such things. Why did you find that shocking? How can the nation's resource belong to anybody? Even if you say it must belong to majority, it will be shocking for me. Mm. I'm not saying it is shocking because it… he pointed at a particular community. Mm. I'm saying it's shocking in a democratic country, which is a secular nation, that you think it should belong to one particular segment of people is wrong, whether it's majority or minority. Mm. So when you make these kind of statements, uh, 
postures and positions get hardened by other people to protect their own interests. What is economic will take on a religious, uh, hell, you know, mm -hmm. uh, hue mm -hmm. altogether. It's essentially an economic issue, but it will take on a religious tinge. Once it takes on a religious tinge, everything becomes uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. Do you think 